this lecture, um, we're, in the next couple lectures, we're going to wrap up this section two of Milne's notes. Um, this lecture is all about finding the ring of integers. And so, what do I mean by this? I mostly mean, how do I determine a set of generators for this ring of integers um, as a Z module, as an abelian group? So just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about in this lecture, um, there are two main pieces. Um, we're going to talk about the relationship between bases and square free discriminants. And we're going to talk about um, some formulas for the discriminant. So it turns out that the discriminant is the primary tool we're going to exploit here. And so being able to compute this uh, in a bunch of different ways is going to turn out to be useful. Okay, so just to give you some introduction, now we know from the last lecture that the ring of integers is a finitely generated abelian group. The ring of integers in a number field. So the, the next natural question is, how do, we, how do we find generators? How do we find a good list of generators for these C modules? So how do we determine generators? Um, OK. <coughs> so the, basically, the main tool we want to export is the discriminant. The main tool, exploit. Is the discriminant. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, the, the, the primary thing we're going to use is the following proposition. Um, so I think this is 23.1 proposition okay um, a collection of elements so I guess let L uh, be a number field so I'll find an extension of Q uh, number field let's say of degree n or of degree m be a number field m over q okay. um, then collection of if so let's say I guess okay let me say it like this we're gonna let we'll let gamma 1 do gamma m these are going to be integral elements of L some subset of the ring of integers O sub L. Then if the discriminant of these guys, D of gamma 1, gamma M, is square free, then they automatically form a basis. A basis for O, O L basis for O L over Z. Okay. So this is kind of the main thing we're going to use. Um, proof. Okay. 
Okay, so recall if let's say n is the submodule they generate the z span of the gamma sub i's, then by proposition 21.1 part 2. Two. What do we know? Um, we have this formula. We get that the discriminant of these guys, gamma sub m, is the index of this submodule squared times the discriminant of the actual. Ring of integers. Okay. So if this guy is square free, if t of gamma one gamma m is square free, then we're kind of uh, we get we're in a pretty lucky situation. Um, then what can we say? Um, this, this basically, these are two integers. Um, so this is an integer, and this is an integer, and this is a square integer. For this guy to be square free, this number has to basically be one. Then, O sub L, the index of O sub L, um, like ostensibly, it could also be negative one, but the index is always positive. So this index has to be one and n equals o sub l as desired. Okay, so it follows immediately from this previous proposition. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of remind you uh, what went into this, basically if you write down like the change of basis matrix from the act from a, a, some basis of o sub l over z to this guy, um, then the this is going to be the determinant of that matrix squared, which in, in the case that your ring is z, the determinant of that matrix also happens to be the index of the submodule. Okay. Um, so yeah, that the thing that I was just talking about there comes from the lecture on free modules. Um, so that finishes this proof. Um, just to warn you, Um, if the discriminant is not square free, it can still, it's still possible that um, you have a basis. It's not an if and only if. Collection of gamma i could still be a basis. So um, the the examples of like rings of integers get fairly complicated fairly quickly. Um, I'll talk about our general approach. So the, the basically the simplest approach is as follows. The simplest approach to describing rings of integers. of integers. Okay, so step one, um, we're going to identify L as something like maybe Q adjoint alpha for some algebraic, um, not just algebraic integral with alpha integral over Z. Step two, 
we're going to compute the discriminant of the power basis of alpha. Alpha, alpha to the m minus one, three. Um, if this is square free, then we're we're golden. So the the way that like the most basic way to find rings of integers is kind of requires a fair bit of luck um, because you need to find a power basis with square free dis discriminant. This is, I mean, this is just guaranteed not to work uh, some non-trivial percentage of the time. So, warning. Um, so, this remark up here really is another warning. So, if this discriminant is not square free, you don't know that this isn't a basis. And the other piece of information is that um, not every ring of integers has a power basis. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through the the example. It's, it's actually kind of um, it's complicated and a little time consuming, but um, if you go to Keith Conrad's website, he does a pretty good job of it doing this example. Not every ring of integers has a power basis. Let's see Keith Conrad's website. And, or I think actually even the um, Milne's exercises does a good um, let's see a couple seconds seeing if I know which one this is. Um, no. Okay. Milne's exercises in chapter two. Okay. So, um, with this in mind, essentially, it becomes useful to have a technique to compute discriminants. Okay. Um, so we see it's useful to have formulas for discriminants. So let's go ahead and talk about our first formula here. So we 23.2 proposition. Let L let's say this is K join beta um, for some beta algebraic. over k, the field of characters is zero. So this characters is zero is mostly useful for the fact that separability is guaranteed. Um, but I think it actually comes up in a slightly different part later too. So. Um, we're going to let f be the minimal polynomial beta over k. And 
and um, so if we have some information about how f factors, so if f factors as the following product, product x minus beta i Um, over the Galois closure of L. Then we can compute the discriminant as follows. The discriminant of 1 beta beta to the m minus 1. So the discriminant of this power basis, there are two useful formulas here. Um, one is some product over all these Galois conjugates, beta i minus beta j, all squared. Okay. Um, and the other is as following sign in front and it's the norm of L over K of F prime of beta. Okay. So there are there are really two two parts to this problem. The first is the product of these differences of Galois conjugates. Um, the second is the uh, norm of the derivative basically up to sign. Okay, so um, first um, let's go ahead and do uh, the, the, this guy here. So I'll call this equality one and this equality two. So proof. We first prove equality one. Okay. Um, the starting point is basically our um, formula for the discriminant using Galois theory. Okay. M minus one. Um, this is remember the determinant of the sigma sub i beta oh I see yeah I remember now okay so this is going to be the determinant of sigma sub i beta sub j um, where the collection of sigma sub i um, these are maps from L. Maybe you can you can do something like this: L to L bar, the algebraic closure. Um, <clears throat> and this is let's see lecture on discriminants in Galois theory. Okay, um, and this should be squared, sorry. Okay, well, these are, um, should be field embeddings. These are uh, ring homomorphisms. Well, then I can split this to be like this. Beta to the j squared. And, well, as sigma runs over all of these embeddings, um, Galois theory basically tells us that um, sigma i of beta is going to run over these different. Um, should be a matrix, sorry, just so that we're clear what's going on. Um, sigma sigma i of beta is going to run over these different Galois conjugates, the beta sub i's. So this is going to be the determinant. Of 
sigma sub i, or sigma, the determinant of beta sub i to the j all squared. Um, so you might ask, like, why does sigma sub i of beta equal beta sub i? Um, basically, you can choose the uh, <laughs> you can choose the order of the beta sub i so that that happens. Um, sigma sub i of beta has to be one of these beta sub i's, and every beta sub i will appear exactly once in the list. Um, so just order the beta sub i's so that the i's match. <laughs> Um, and then the last thing is just something called the the Vandermond determinant. Um, I'm not going to go through the proof of the Vandermond determinant. Um, it's probably, if you've taken like a graduate algebra course, this is almost certainly something you've seen. Um, it's not. I mean, it's just like a combinatorial thing almost. And. Dermond determinant, um, and if you are wondering like what's going on here, how do I go from here to here? I would say see wiki, see the Wikipedia page. I'm sure they give a, a proof. Of the the Vandermond determinant. <coughs> okay. So. Um, this basically verifies the the first formula that we had. The second equality is a little bit m trickier, so we proved the second equality now. So we're going to start from one and go to two. Two from one. Okay. So. Uh, Start out with this guy, i less than j less than or equal to m, beta sub i minus beta sub j, all squared. This is, so I'm going to split each of these square terms into the following, beta sub i minus beta sub j times negative 1 times beta sub j minus beta sub i. Okay, So essentially I've taken one of these guys, flipped it around, and put a negative 1 out in front. Okay, um, And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split up my product and bring all the negative 1's out in front. So. <coughs> Now this is going to be a product over, so let me do this properly. Um, it's going to be negative 1 to the m times m minus 1 over 2 times the product over i equals 1 to m product over j not equal to i beta sub i minus beta sub j. So what do we do in the second step? Um, so here we changed i to always be the index of the first guy. Always be the index of the first beta sub i of the first beta. Okay. Um, up here there are m times m minus one over two terms in the sum. Um, you can think of this as like some like diagonal entries. In an m by m matrix, how many um, entries are there on or above the diagonal? Something like that. Um, and so what's going on here? Oh, actually just above the diagonal, not on or above. Just above the diagonal. 
because it's it's the pairs i and j um, so that i is less than j so you should think of these as i being the rows j being the columns um, something like that just above the diagonal so not that okay so they're going to be m times m minus 1 over 2 of these terms that's where I just pulled out the negative one, um, and yeah, I've just changed the index so that i is always the uh, first beta. Okay, so direct computation using the product rule. So using the product rule on. What is this? F. This is the product of x minus the beta i's. What does that give us? It gives that F prime of beta sub i is the product over j not equal to i beta i minus beta j. Okay, so you can check this for yourself. Use the product rule on this thing and plug in beta sub i. Um, and the only term that's not going to get killed um, is this one. Okay, then what do we see? The discriminant beta the m minus 1 is negative 1 the m times m minus 1 over 2 times the product over i of f prime of beta so i okay. and finally we're going to note that the Kawa conjugates the Galois conjugates of f prime of beta are sigma sub i of f prime of beta. Well, this is f prime of beta is a polynomial with coefficients in k, so these two things are going to commute f prime sigma sub i of beta which is f prime of beta sub i. Okay, so by our notes on norm and trace, or norm trace and Galois theory, so by our notes on norm trace and Galois theory, Um, we know that the norm can be written as the product over the Galois conjugates. Data to the m minus 1. Um, this is uh, negative 1 to the m times m minus 1 over 2 times the norm from l over k of f prime of beta. Okay, so we've proven this second formula here. Um, this this second formula is probably generally the easiest um, because all I have to do is compute the norm of a single element. Um, but uh, it turns out there'll, there'll be an actually an easier way to do this in for the case of certain polynomials. Um, so let me go ahead and end with the next formula here. So let me, this will be 23.3. So first I'm going to tell you what the discriminant of a polynomial is. So I'm going to let f be a polynomial
polynomial irreducible over a field k. We define the discriminant of f to be discriminant of f uh, one simple definition, so I guess this should be in red. Let me go ahead and do this properly. The discriminant of f is the following discriminant 1x dot 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 x to the degree of f minus 1 inside k join x mod f so essentially it's this discriminant up here if f is the minimal polynomial of beta, then it's this discriminant. Um, so what we now do is write down a, a useful polynomial, a useful formula for the discriminant. So uh, remark, I guess, if L equals K join beta, And um, let's say f is the minimal polynomial of k over beta, or of beta over k. So <laughs> minimal polynomial of beta over k. Then um, d of 1 beta beta to the degree of f minus 1 is exactly the discriminant of f. So um, essentially, if we have tools for dis computing the discriminants of polynomials, um, then they'll be useful for computing these discriminants, which will be in turn useful for determining um, bases for our rings of integers. Um, and I'm just going to state one last proposition. I'm not going to prove it. Um, it. It's similar to these above computations where it boils down to like a bunch of algebra. Um, so the following 23.4 proposition. Um, so we're going to suppose we have a polynomial in the following form. x to the n plus ax plus b. Um, and we're going to suppose this is irreducible. Probably over a field of characteristic 0, um, but I think maybe it's enough to assume irreducible and it's separable. Then the discriminant of f has the following formula. So this is this is far and away the most useful formula for discriminants. Negative one to the n times n minus one over two n to the power n b to the n minus one plus negative one to the n minus one times n minus one to the power n minus one times a to the n. Okay, so um, like I said, we're not going to work through the proof here. Um, you essentially use this last formula here um, together with basically the, the main challenge is how do I take the coefficients and understand the roots, basically. Um, so I have this formula in terms of the roots, basically, in terms of this root beta. Um, how can I make this formula a formula now in the coefficients of f? Um, 
and you need to basically do some clever out algebra. And you, you can find this in Milne um, in the in this section of the same name, finding the ring of integers. Proof C Milne. Um, and just to kind of wrap up with something nice, let's let's see what this um, tells us about a quadratic. Okay, so when let's say f. Well, normally you'd say a x squared equals b x plus c, or a x squared plus b x plus c. Um, But uh, supposing I divide through by my uh, leading term, so x squared is going to be b over a x plus b over or c over a c over a. Okay. Then what does the discriminant um, formula give? Then the discriminant of f. In this case, n equals 2, so it's going to be negative 1, 2 times 1 over 2 times 2 squared b to the n minus 1. So this is b over a to the, the n minus 1, which is 1, plus negative 1 to the 1 times 1 to the 1. Oh, I screwed this up. This should be c over a, because b corresponds to the constant term here. This should be c over a, so this is a little confusing, but it should be c over a, and this should be a to the n, which should be b over a squared. Let's see here. Okay, now just simplifying out. This is going to be so negative one. This is going to be negative one to the one. So negative one times four c over a negative one minus b squared over a squared. <laughs> okay, which is going to ultimately be um, if I make a common denominator here, it'll be negative. Oh, I guess I should maybe pass the negative through and swap the order of multiplication. Um, it'll be b squared minus 4ac all over a squared. Okay. And if I take the, um, what do I want to say here? This is almost the discriminant, the typical discriminant that we've raised with. It's not quite the same. Yeah, so this, you can see our um, discriminant cropping up. If a were equal to 1 and this were just x squared plus bx plus c, then this would exactly match because it'd be b squared minus 4c. Um, yeah, there's... Well, I guess... Um, I guess technically it is exactly the discriminant that you would be you would know. This is b squared minus four ac. Um, if this is b and this is c, then these. What am I trying to say? If you computed the discriminant of this polynomial using the definition you maybe learned in high school, and you compute it using this formula, they are the exact same thing. So this discriminant exactly matches the definition that you may have seen before. In the case that your polynomial is monic, at least. Okay, um, so that pretty much wraps up the lecture.